just imagine for a moment, instead of waiting for something good to happen, to be celebrated, just imagine for a moment that we live in hope, waiting for trauma to arrive. We do this so that in return, we would be provided with a nirvana of perspective, just like the ones that we hear about in certain cases that are presented after life-changing experiences. On this stage and many other stages across the world, we hear post-traumatic perspective as its thread of intention to inspire and spark thought-provoking conversation. But that's only to an ever-sympathetic audience because you may have already have a glimpse of the trauma because of the introduction, or you see my physical appearance. You haven't had to live and wait in hope for the trauma to arrive to get the perspective. You get it now, the trauma in this reflective talk. It's rather profound to think, what if life changed right now? What if our today isn't going to be our tomorrow anymore. It's easy to, in reflection, to be proud of your accomplishments. It's easy, in reflection, to look back and be proud that you're out of the dark days where you're, they were full of doubt, guilt, shame. But it's easy, in reflection, to look back and be completely unaware that the experiences we are having create unique components of the people that we've become today. And that's crucial to my story. I grew up here in Aberdeen, in a very respectable suburban area, right here in the northeast of Scotland, and my family and all of my friends all looked like mine. Four bedroom houses, two kids, a mum and dad, and lights surrounded the houses at Christmas. There was a very, within that privileged life, there was a very naive, close-minded, programmed way of living. That is until you grow up and you start to feel and be treated like the odd one out. And then very quickly, that, pers uh, that privilege is replaced with persistent fear where persistent fear now takes its stand as privilege in your life. School was difficult. I was eager to learn, but I was encouraged to not be myself on too many occasions. I was constantly fighting against this current unknown. I had friends, friends that would tell the lads where I was having my lunch so that they could come and verbally or physically assault me. I had friends that instigated violence on me. There's still people walking these streets today that hold a criminal record for assaulting me. Those same friends would invite me down to their house. We'd have, we'd play happy best friends, we'd have fun, we'd, they'd make me straighten their hair, we'd go shopping, we'd spend Christmas together, but the minute the lens was on them and they had to take some responsibility, or if I stood up for myself, I became an inconvenience. I hated looking weak, so I spent most of those days silent. And as a result, my education was compromised and my focus was menaced. But I was a born performer. I loved the bright lights, the stage, singing, dancing. It was everything that I could think about. That born performer personality, the intuitive personality that I held, saved me so many times from humiliation and isolation. But it also created humiliation and isolation. It was becoming clear that within the compound of my perfect privilege, certain choices I was trying to figure out or I was making were deemed unnecessary or unforgiving. Performing was the only pathway that I had to survival. It was the only thing I could hold on to. But you match the perfect privilege idea and then put a stereotype on top of that, and then all I got was, he must be gay. 
So what that presents is very little security. What that says is you have choices, but not too many choices, and you need to make the right choice. But if you don't choose the right choice, then we're going to suffocate you until you make the right choice. And then life surprises you. It did a 180, and it created a pin on the map of my life, one that would change the course of it forever. And the origin of that pin is the roadmap to today. So I moved to London. I was ready to make it big, see my name in lights. I started making friends, ones that were in the big shows, the ones that I could only have ever dreamt of being in, the fancy cars, the big paychecks. My perfect privileged London was ready for takeoff. I was out one night with some friends in Soho, and Soho had my heart. It was the first time that I had seen people that were like me, friendly, welcoming. This odd one out felt at home. I didn't have much money. Nobody really does when they're in their early 20s living in London. So I paid cash when we were out. I was terrified of my bank card being declined in front of my big paycheck friends. So I used cash, and the cash ran out. So I went to an ATM to get cash. And on the way back, I was lured into a, an apartment corridor. It was just off of one of the busiest streets, so it didn't seem odd. Everyone was like me, friendly, welcoming. I never made it back to the bar that night. In fact, I never made it home. I woke up two days later in an apartment miles away from Soho. It was during those two days that I had been drugged and raped. Now I was really humiliated and isolated. My life from there became a turning wheel of repetition. I was just this young guy trying to make it big, see his name in lights. I only valued myself based on the experiences that I had. So this experience matched with my perfect privileged upbringing. And then the lack of representation in mainstream media for people like me resulted in years of chaos. Periods of addiction across the board came into my life from alcohol to substances, even food. That was my coping mechanism. Life grew smaller and smaller and smaller, and I started to forget who I was. And the shows that I could only have ever dreamt of being in no longer showed up in my dreams at night. I couldn't see anything, I just felt fear. Soon after this, I played around with the idea of taking my own life. And one night, I sat on the edge of a bridge. And I looked up to the sky. I don't know who I was talking to, but I just said, if there's a reason for me being here, please put my feet on the floor and walk me home. And my feet made it to the floor. And I went home and I packed my bags and I moved back here to Scotland. I made a pact with myself during those three years. It's going to, you know, it takes three years to become an expert in something. So I was to go home, become an expert in me. Three years. And if all is well, I'll come back with an honorary degree in me. So I did everything I needed to do. I passed the tests, I put all the assignments in. I built a great career specializing in a brand new sector in special needs education, and I loved it. It was exactly what I needed at that point in my life, the people, the students. It was everything I needed to fill my soul, but time was up, and I had to go back, chase the bright lights. So I packed my life up and moved. I drove all the way to London, it felt like four days. I spent most of the time crying and 
wiping the tears away and trying to catch my breath as I answered the phone to get an update on the journey. I arrived no less than 48 hours before my 30th birthday. And tomorrow will be exactly one year to the day. As soon as I got back, I felt the same that I did all those years ago. I pulled myself together and I spent the birth my birthday with some friends in Battersea Park. We had a picnic, it was perfect. And then I waved them goodbye and that was the last time that anyone saw. I had some choices now and these are up to me. I chose wrong over right that night. And by the time both of my legs had climbed over the balcony of my fourth floor apartment, I wasn't cognitively aware of who I was, where I was. I certainly wasn't aware of what I was about to embark on. The only thing in between those choices and my future was a 50-foot drop. And I hit the floor. Somebody called 999, it was the middle of the night, and luckily somebody saw. They called 999 and they worked on me for an hour and 20 minutes at the scene because I was so critical. I was taken to St. Mary's Hospital in central London, and I arrived and they found, this is my Grey's Anatomy moment, open left pylon with anterior dislocation with left calcaneum fracture, open communicated left calcaneum fracture with right ankle wound, open left radial distus fracture with scaphoid fracture, closed right distal radius fracture with scaphoid fracture, bilateral fifth and sixth rib fractures, comminuted vertebrae fractures L1, L2, L3, L4, subsequent seizures, and a small right-sided subdural hematoma. That's why I've got the cards. It was chaotic and confusing as it sounds. I had eight surgeries over the next 14 days, in and out. And for the next three months, I would stay in hospital. I was a mess. I had to learn how to put clothes on. I had to learn how to brush my teeth. I couldn't properly wave to people. And the hardest part, it's still ongoing, is learning how to walk again. But thanks to the amazing staff, they helped me get this far today. I've had to see new ways of using this old thing. But something I've learned is I don't see Sam pre-accident as old Sam, and I don't see Sam today as new Sam. I'm the same Sam. The only difference is experience or response, but mostly experience. I have this shiny new post-traumatic perspective as well now. That post-traumatic perspective has given me a new hope for life. It's given me, it's made me think that anything in my future, if I've ever seen it as impossible, it's made me think of the impossible as possible. I woke up after five days of being in a coma and the first thing I felt was relief. I felt relieved that I no longer had to tolerate behavior that was unnecessary or unforgiving. I've got a voice. I've got a reason for people to listen to me. I don't underestimate that. But that voice just isn't to talk to you here today, it's to stand up for myself. I chose for so long to hide inside the pain because that feeling felt familiar. What kind of life is it when you choose to hide inside the familiar feeling of pain? We're nurtured as kids with a clear, fresh perspective of the world. I might never be able to turn back to the time where the switch happened from 
perfect privilege to my beautiful trauma, but I choose now to feel the pain, process the pain, and I can loathe it when I want to forget it. Just imagine for a moment if you could live today with a post-traumatic perspective without the trauma. How would you live your life? What would you say? How would you treat people? I'm broken in so many ways, emotionally, physically. But I can say with my hand on my heart, being broken isn't so bad when you allow yourself to feel. It's a hard flight. You don't want to take it. And you definitely don't want to be responsible for someone else taking theirs. Thank you.